from as early as 1943, or even 1942 in some cases, it was obvious to many that Germany was not going to win in their struggle against the Allies and the Soviets. Operation Barbarossa had been repulsed at the gates of Moscow. The supply lines simply could not handle the distance or the weather. 1942 brought fresh gains, but not in the same league as the previous years. There was no going back, and a slow, painful two-year retreat ensued. Those who had willingly collaborated with the Germans in the east came to, from Estonia in the north to the Cossack hosts of the south, millions of civilians had welcomed the German army as liberators with flowers and kisses. Now, these actions were to have consequences as the Soviets entered the towns that they had been expelled from once more. Masses of Ukrainians or ethnic Germans from the Soviet Union, such as the Mennonites, among others, began the great trek west along with the German army and their allies, knowing what would happen to them if they stayed. Things progressed from a trickle to a flood as the collapse continued, and by 1945, the roads into Germany's borders and beyond were absolutely packed with refugees. Although some chose to live in blissful ignorance of the fate that awaited them at the hands of the Soviets, millions did not, and set off west to join the mass. Let's discuss the reality of the Eastern Front in the final months of the war, and the hell that descended on the German people. A disclaimer before we begin. I'm going to be discussing some of the most vile things I've ever had to read. So whilst I will try to tone the language down, for example, replacing the R word with violent sexual assault or something similar, it may still be hard to listen to. Also, I will make no political statements in this video. I will simply recount events from those that were there. If you think these German civilians deserved it, that's your prerogative, but I'm just recounting what happened. I will not be able to cover the entire story of the German civilians in the East, or I'd be talking for a lifetime with how varied each person's experience was. But hopefully, this gives you a good overview of events from the examples I do give. Also, a huge thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible with their generous support. If you enjoy these videos and want to support the channel and join the Discord, please consider clicking the link in the description to sign up for as little as $2 a month. Thank you. Nemersdorf was a tiny, sleepy town situated right on the eastern border of East Prussia. As the Soviets approached in October 1944, the city still remained its sleepy self. The residents had been spared the horrors of the Allied aerial bombardments, due to them being both an unimportant little town and also being miles out of range of the bombers. Erich Koch, the district chief of East Prussia, who was both a fanatical Nazi and a devout Lutheran Christian, demanded that everyone stay put. If anyone attempted to flee, it could lead to a death sentence, and even causing panic by withdrawing funds or slaughtering farm animals could bring the same fate. No true German would allow himself even the thought that East Prussia might fall into Russian hands, said Koch. He didn't need to speak in such terms. Many Germans were ready to see this story out till the end, no matter the cost. Even these types had no idea what was in store for them, however. Most Prussians laughed at some of the stories they had heard of Soviet brutality towards civilians. They thought they were bad, but not devils. Most things were dismissed as simply Goebbels' propaganda about the Asiatic hordes trying to scare the Germans into fighting till the end. They were correct. Goebbels was wrong. In fact, he had undersold the problem. That evening of October 20th, the Soviets punched a hole in the German defences and swarmed over the countryside. They were pushed back after a few days and the land lost, reclaimed. But when the German army marched back into these towns, they were lost for words. One German officer reported afterwards, they tortured civilians in many villages, nailed some on barn doors, and shot many others. Others recounted how refugee columns had been overran, people pulled from their carts, and then brutally sexually assaulted before being shot on the spot. An army physician recalled of one of these columns. On the road through Nemersdorf, near the bridge, I saw where a whole trek of refugees had been rolled over by Russian tanks. Not only the wagons and teams, but also a goodly number of civilians, mostly women and children. They had been squashed flat by the tanks. At the edge of the road and in the farmyards lay quantities of corpses of civilians who evidently had been murdered systematically. Another spoke of similar scenes in a farmyard where he found four naked women who had been nailed against the barn door in a crucifix position. As the soldiers pushed further into the town, one said, In the dwellings, we found a total 
of 72 women, including children and one old man, 74, all dead, all murdered in a bestial manner, except only a few who had bullet holes in their necks. Some babies had their heads bashed in. In one room, we found a woman, 84 years old, sitting on a sofa, half of whose head had been sheared off with an axe or a spade. Murder wasn't the only crime on the menu. A horrified soldier recounted that every female, including girls as young as eight, had been R-worded. Old men trying to prevent these sexual crimes against their daughters, granddaughters, or even wives had been knocked down, and in many cases, sawn in half or cut into pieces. Over 50 French prisoners of war and Polish workers had stepped in to intervene and stop the madness. For their good deed, they were killed just as brutally. Many castrated. The reports flooded back to the rest of Germany. Many didn't even believe them because they sounded so surreal. Independent investigators from neutral nations such as Spain, Sweden and Switzerland came to make reports of their own and their findings matched that of the Germans. When these reports were released, however, no one in the outside world cared. The propaganda whipped up against the German people was so severe in countries such as Great Britain that many saw these acts as the German people getting just what they had deserved. Many Germans, even now, refused to believe the stories coming from the East. But as story after story turned out exactly like that of Nemensdorf, the message started to set in. The cold reality that they too, innocent civilians, would be treated the same as, if not worse than, actual German soldiers sent many to the brink of insanity as the Soviets approached. Many joined the endless waves of refugees heading west with their families and whatever little personal possessions they could find. Others simply accepted their fate. Maybe they'd get lucky. Not all of the Soviet troops were like that, they thought. And they were right, but they were rolling the dice. Food was the most pressing issue of all for both those fleeing and those staying. Shipments of food that would usually arrive in hours took days and then weeks to arrive. When it finally did arrive, Half of the time, it would be mouldy anyway. One woman in Berlin, near the end, summed it up well. My center is the stomach. All my thinking, feeling, desires and hopes begin with food. Food may have been a problem, however drinking was not. For example, somehow, in Berlin, out of the 17 breweries there, 11 were still running amidst the rubble. To cope with the unbearable stress weighing down on them, many Germans turned to the bottle. Massive parties were held in whatever buildings still stood, and many of those in attendance would simply drink until they passed out. A lot of these people were so dedicated to drinking to avoid the reality they were faced with that many parties would simply carry on whilst the bombs rained down on their head. One Berliner remembered, Around 10 o'clock, the siren broke up the festivities with its harsh warning. While the guests hesitated and time was wasted in deciding where to take shelter, a blast shook the house. As it was too late to leave, the orchestra played louder. All joined in the dancing and singing to drown out the sound of explosions, to drink and forget. Another common phrase was, today we're happy, tomorrow we're dead. Many had sunk into a total fatalism. Another escape from the current reality and the unbearable thought of what was to come was sex. All moral norms were thrown out of the window and many people just went at it whenever and however they could. Many at the time described how sex among passing strangers was a normal sight as the war entered its final months, whether it be on park benches, in random doorways, or just in random piles of rubble. Orgies were commonplace. A German soldier describes how he and 11 of his men entered a barn for a night's sleep, when suddenly the barn door sprung open and a crowd stormed in. I jumped up and grabbed my rifle next to me. Ivan is not getting me without a shot out of my rifle, was my instinctive thought. Well. It was an attack, but not by Ivan. It was an attack by the females of that farm. They were falling over us, hugging and kissing every soldier in the barn until they were consumed in what nature calls for. One girl or woman, as fat as an elephant, fell over me. In the dim light of the few bulbs lighting the barn, I could see that she was very ugly. The natural drive for love had overcome them, especially under the conviction that their lives would be over as soon as the Russians arrived here. <laughs> 
Whether one stayed put, or chose to flee with their family westwards, they were rolling the dice. The people were in an impossible situation, and absolutely no choice was guaranteed to keep them safe. If they fled, they were braving the elements. Most were in nothing but rags, their clothes barely held together by a thread or string. If they could survive the bitter cold, they would have to survive the Soviet Air Force attacking them on sight. And then, when they got far enough west, the same issue would arise, but with British or American planes. Those that stayed were placing their fate in the hands of whichever unit would be the one to take their town. Many, in futile attempts to get better treatment from the enemy, would leave out presents like alcohol or prepare a welcoming party. The results depended on who you got. Many described their first encounter with Soviet units being a great relief. Often, a stereotypical white Russian army officer type, kind of like Peter Rangel, would appear. These kinds of men would often carry themselves extremely professionally, not drink and maintain strict discipline amongst their troops. They would fraternise with the locals, although it would often seem very tense. They would usually leave on good terms to make way for the rear units to move in as they advanced. These men would all depart with a similar message. The warning was loud and clear. The men to come, they would explain, were nothing like them. These were not men with the same values. The next group to arrive were those accustomed to the roughest of conditions with totally different morals. The criminals, the thugs, as well as those easiest to spot and most feared of all, those from the Asian provinces of Russia. And it must be said that many atrocities were carried out by your average Red Army soldier also, but many accounts seem to specifically mention those referred to as Asiatics, so Mongolians, Uzbeks or Kazakhs, etc. Most towns were not spared. Some had a lucky first encounter, but after that, it was all downhill, all the way to hell itself. Some incidents I can't even cite, as they were simply too disgusting for YouTube. A particularly grotesque account is from a hospital surgeon named Hans Graf von Leyendorf, who refused to leave his post inside Konigsberg and remained behind to tend to the wounded as the Soviets marched in. The arrival of the first officers destroyed my last hopes of coming to tolerable terms. Any attempt to talk to them failed. Even for them, I'm only a coat rack with pockets. They only see me from the shoulders downwards. A few nurses who got in their way were seized and dragged off and then released again, thoroughly dishevelled before they realised what was happening. The older nurses were the first victims. They wandered aimlessly among the corridors, but there was no place to hide and new tormentors kept pouncing upon them. These nurses weren't the only ones. Extreme sexual violence was the most common weapon used against the civilian population, and almost nothing, save individual brave officers sometimes intervening, was in their way to stop them. It was even encouraged. Many were so utterly whipped up on propaganda by men such as Ilya Ehrenberg, who fired out propaganda encouraging soldiers to commit the most vile acts, saw it as gospel, and that the gist thing to do was to commit these acts against civilians. Nuns were perhaps the number one victim. The Soviet Union strictly enforced state atheism, and Christianity especially, was despised. To find these women of God, untouched by any man, regardless of their age, was like a dream come true to some of these communists. In fact, age everywhere didn't seem to stop the frenzy. Varying accounts from all over the Eastern Front describe women aged as old as 80, and children as young as 8, or even below in some cases, becoming victims. In one case, a woman tried offering herself to the invaders, as she saw it as inevitable anyway, and this way, Maybe they would be less rough. She was wrong. They were disgusted by her offerings. Instead, they shoved her aside and moved on to her grandmother's room, who did resist. Often, as soon as the onrushing Soviets were done, they would shoot their victims, often torturing them first. I won't even describe what was done to some of these women. Basically, whatever comes to mind, that probably happened. Those killed were often the lucky ones. Many women were described as being used as many as dozens, if not more times, per day some hundreds over the course of the passing weeks and months. Understandably, a lot just went insane. They were essentially wandering zombies with dead eyes, waiting for the end, or for their next violator to turn up and take them before they continued their insane wandering. One priest in Danzig recalls how hundreds of women and little girls asked a Russian officer for protection. He kindly showed them towards a Catholic church. After all of them were inside, it became obvious he wasn't being kind after all. The officer yelled to his men, and they all rushed inside where absolute hell on earth broke out. Some women were violated over 30 times just in that one night. The priest says 
even eight-year-old girls would not spare these crimes, and that young boys who had to shield their mothers were simply shot like it was nothing, while the Soviets carried on about their deeds. The sick were fair game also. Von Leyendorf describes how the Soviets discovered a local brewery and then marched into the hospital and began running room to room, using the nurses and patients alike for whatever they wanted, and then setting the place on fire. An evacuation began, and quote, Soon the whole hillside was occupied by patients, and the Russians were rushing wildly among them like a horde of baboons, carrying off indiscriminately nurses or patients, harassing them, and demanding watches for the hundredth time. I shouldered again a rather heavy man, and had just crossed the footbridge when I was stopped by a Russian. I had to drop the man. The Russian ransacked him, then shot him in the belly as if by mistake, and went on. The man sat there, looking at me, an inquiry in his eyes. If only I could have given him the finishing shot. I gave him a dose of morphine and left him lying by the side of the road. Children were either a blessing or a curse. Often, when a man was about to assault a woman and her children appeared, his conscience would intervene and they would move along to another, unable to do such an act to a mother in front of her children. Sometimes, if the men continued, the mother would negotiate so that their children would be able to go outside and wait until the deed was done before mother would call them back inside so at least they would not have to see. Often, worse occurred. One woman in a crowded cellar, being overrun by bloodthirsty men, taking advantage of everyone in sight, recalls how a young mother was grabbed when she was trying to hide her three children. The children began to scream, and the gigantic soldier simply hurled them headfirst into a wall, one after the other, crushing their skulls. The woman became absolutely hysterical, and obviously nothing would calm her down, and no negotiating or shielding her by those present stopped group after group arriving and taking advantage of her. Another woman, a 19-year-old Brazilian worker named Leonora Cavoa, who was with the Women's Right Labour Service, was spared the fate of the others due to her nation being friendly with the Allies. She was not spared the fate of having to witness these acts, however. She recounts a horrible event where Polish soldiers located her camp along with the other 500 women there. They rounded up the ones they considered prettiest and took them into a room, one by one, where they forced Kavoa to watch as they individually cut off each woman's breasts before killing them in various ways and then brought the next in. Each seemed to have a worse fate than the last. One woman was brought in and sliced in half before the Poles and Russians poured diesel inside of her and tried to set her alight. Another had her underwear and bra covered in oil and then she was also set alight. Kavoa continued to vomit, but the commissar simply held her in place and forced her to watch. He was enjoying every second. The commissar said to her, quote, Watch and learn how to turn the master race into whimpering bits of misery. I could go on. This was common all over the front. But for the sake of your stomach, I'll save you more examples. Men were treated just about as you'd expect. In these villages, it was mostly the very young or the very old. These were simply in the way and were tortured and killed in their own uniquely grotesque ways if they tried to intervene with the Soviets, taking advantage of their family members. Many were simply killed for no reason other than sport. But understandably, the legacy of the Soviet advance is ultimately based on what happened to the women. These events, to varying degrees, was what those who decided to stay behind in their hometowns received. Very few have positive things to say, or even neutral. None of their lives would ever be the same again, if they survived. Those that fled suffered a horrifying, if less intimate, fate. Instead of coming face to face with a crazed, drunken Soviet soldier, they were greeted with bullets and bombs. At least, the lucky ones were. Those unfortunate enough to have set off late were simply flattened by the oncoming Soviet tanks. They had no time to clear the roads and were more than happy to crush these women and children and then reverse over them a few more times for good measure. Those who made it to refugee havens like Dresden to at least recover for a while before continuing on weren't spared the horrors. When Dresden was firebombed by the Allies and over 100,000 civilians were incinerated, the city was packed with refugees, and it was at double its usual population. Those in cities like Breslau, which became German fortresses behind enemy lines, had no choice. Civilians were expelled by the German army, so that they weren't a drain on resources. Those staying to fight didn't have much better odds of survival, but those leaving were sitting ducks for the Soviet and then Allied air forces. The biting cold wiped out many almost as soon as they began, Horrified and distraught mothers were sometimes left with no choice but to dump their frozen children who had long since died on the sides of the roads and continue on. Bodies littered the countryside, whether it be from bullets and bombs or simply the weather. 
Those who had set off early and managed to survive the weather felt they were saved. They had reached the Elbe River, where the Allies had been ordered to stop on the other side. The Allies, in German minds, were far more similar to them than the Russians. The Allied war had always been a side quest compared to the main war on the Eastern Front, and even Nazi propaganda was far kinder to the Brits and Americans arriving in the West. Signs had been put up by civilians pointing the way to Berlin, and many held hopes that the Allies would continue on and fight the Soviets themselves. Many Germans simply could not understand why the Allies couldn't see that the Soviets were the true enemy. Ultimately though, when they reached the river, it was again a roll of the dice. Eisenhower strictly forbid letting German civilians cross in the American areas, and as a result, many thousands more were killed, mutilated, or sexually abused, or a mix of the three, by the oncoming Soviet forces. Those who were across the river from the Brits had a different story. Montgomery was under no illusions about what lay in store for those innocent civilians if they were left across the riverbank in their rags with almost no food, awaiting their fate at the hands of the Soviets. Whilst the RAF was happy to strafe and kill these people, the British army was not. The floodgates were open and Germans poured across the river and mingled among the British soldiers, grateful that their lives had been saved by Montgomery's heroic act of kindness. Those seeking to leave by sea in the coastal cities suffered some of the worst fates of all. The ports resembled Dunkirk, but with civilians. As the noose slowly tightened around these ports, the crowds grew larger and larger, desperately trying to get on board whatever ships they could. Babies were often a golden ticket to get on board, as there simply wasn't enough space on board the ships. Family members would sometimes drop children from the upper decks for others they knew to catch, so that they could get on board too. Often though, the child would simply disappear into the ocean or crack down onto the earth. Some babies were even stolen from vulnerable mothers so that the thief could be passed off as a mother or father themselves and get their ticket to safety. Horrible crushes often resulted on the docks, but when it was all said and done, tens of thousands managed to get on these ships, although horribly crowded. If those on board thought they were home free, they were wrong. These ships were prime targets for Soviet torpedoes. It didn't matter if it was a cruise ship, an actual military target, or a hospital boat, they were all targeted. A prime example was the Wilhelm Gustloff. Pre-war, this cruise ship had been used to provide free or heavily discounted holidays for workers under Hitler's Strength Through Joy program to places like the Portuguese island of Madeira. Now, it was trying to rescue German citizens from certain doom. Once out to sea, however, the ship was hit by three Soviet torpedoes. Only nine lifeboats could be lowered as the rest had frozen stiff. Those on board died from the stampedes to reach the lifeboats, the torpedoes themselves, or from being thrown off the lifeboats when the boat listed. That's even before the ship went under. The majority of deaths were caused by freezing to death in the minus 10 to minus 18 degree temperatures. When all was said and done, barely 1,000 would survive and over 9,500 died. Although exact figures are impossible to calculate as it could be more due to how many people were packing into these ships. Ultimately, in any war, you're rolling the dice. And when Hitler chose to invade Poland, whether you believe it was to conquer Eastern Europe or to stop the Polish atrocities against Germans there, he knew this too. If the war went badly, he must have been well aware that greater harm would fall upon the German people than what he was preventing in Poland. The same goes for his invasion of the Soviet Union. Heavy reprisals were expected, and the German people understood this, and most were more than willing to fight this story to the end with their Fuhrer, who they supported until the day he died. Perhaps they may have changed their minds if they saw what was to come, when the Soviets ended up in Germany, however. Reprisals are expected and normal, especially given how many Soviet civilians would perish at the hands of others who welcomed the Germans, or at the hands of the Germans themselves. But what isn't normal is the sheer level of barbarity used by the oncoming Soviet invaders. The accounts sound like they belong to a Mongolian invasion of the 13th century, not 20th century Europe. No justification can be put forward for such acts. There simply is no explanation for what I've just covered, such as the torture of those innocent women in the camp witnessed by the Brazilian worker. There is no justification for the sexual crimes committed against those children, not once, but literally hundreds of times. There is no justification for crucifying people to barn doors. World War II was a horrible war, and atrocities were committed on every single side, but the amount of horror that occurred 
in such a short space of time as when the Soviets advanced is in its own realm of insanity, and may it never happen again. Thank you very much for watching. I have more on this topic to make, but next week I think I'll do a different video, as these videos can be difficult to get through due to the disgusting subject matter. A final thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible. Thank you to Lobster to You, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Lanza, Friendly Brian, Mr Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, and Henry Unruh. And if you do want to join our Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or if you just simply want to support me for as little as $2, please click the link in the description. Thank you.